Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chips and Salsa, where we discuss security at Intel. I'm Jerry Bryant. I'm Krobe. Today, our special guest is Stephanie Domas, who is joining us to talk about a new document we've just published, Security at Intel. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> so we're, we're glad to have you here. Absolutely. So let's dive into this. Um, so Stephanie, why why is this an important topic for us to discuss today? So security is one of those just fundamental things that I think is table stakes in any type of technology. And so what we're here to do today is talk a little bit about, well, what is Intel doing about the security of our products? You know, our products are in literally billions of devices, whether it's our processors, our memory, our network cards, our graphics cards. We touch so many things out there. So I really think it's important to shed some transparency on, well, what is it we're doing for security? Um, so one of the things, the slide you're showing right now is, uh, you know, it's important to understand what we're doing for security, but I think it's really also important for people to understand the role that hardware security mm -hmm. plays. Um, I think there is this, there's sort of an underappreciation of the role that hardware security and hardware-based security um, plays. A lot of people sort of stop thinking at the software level. And so part of this is let's open their eyes to the role hardware plays. So hardware in and of itself, plays an immense role in actually enabling software-based security. So there's a number of things that software is potentially capable of doing, but for performance reasons, um, it can be infeasible. So think of things like crypto acceleration, where um, that acceleration at the hardware-based level actually makes that more feasible, makes that more impactful and able to do at scale. But beyond that, there's actually things from a security perspective that can be done at the hardware layer that actually software can't do just because of the nature of where the hardware is sitting, the things it can see, the telemetry that it can gather on side of the processor. So there's actually great things the hardware can do that software is actually just not capable of doing. Um, beyond that, we're also starting to see more and more attacks against the hardware layer because it represents that sort of full case to the kingdom if you can get in at the hardware level. So the security at the hardware level is also important because attacks are starting to shift to the hardware level. So on those main three fronts, that's why you should be concerned and interested in learning about hardware security. That's pretty awesome. It's uh, interesting. And before coming to Intel, I was really unaware. Could you maybe share a little bit about what we do around here around security? Absolutely. So fair warning, this this is a 10,000 foot view only. Um, every single one of these could go into just a literal book on what we're doing in each of these. So I'm gonna focus very much on this holistic high level view, um, but happy to talk your ear, anyone's ear off if they're curious. So <laughs> there's two main tenets that we like to talk about that make up sort of our story of security at Intel. Um, and these are the way we work, which we think about through our security practices and what we work on, which is the technology. And historically being a technology company and with many of us who are listening and myself included having technology background, we often really think about the technology side of security. And I will be the first to say technology plays a huge role in it, but the practices are really that force multiplier that takes security to the next level. So I'm actually gonna start by talking about the practices. So security, you'll hear me say, uh, security is not just a feature that can be added to a system. It's an emergent property of a well-designed system. And that is why security is a part of literally every stage of our product development and life cycle. So from inception through um, product development, through market, through end of market, our products all go through a really rigorous um, secure development life cycle. So our SDL. And our SDL, for an example, has up to 400 different security requirements that get put on projects. So there is potentially a lot of security um, requirements that they're going to need to meet, show evidence for, conduct. Security doesn't stop after manufacturing. So our threat discovery and response practices is all about ongoing security support to our fielded products. And we really heavily in product security research. We have an in-house team of offensive security researchers, but we also do a lot of community engagement through things like our bug bounty program. Mm -hmm. And then of course the technology ecosystem and the ecosystem is so immensely complex and Intel, we understand we are a piece of a larger puzzle, right? And so we work across the landscape by partnering with empowering, educating industry partners and regulators really looking for those 
build better together security outcomes at the end of the day to protect our users. For the technology side, my goal really isn't to talk about specific Intel technologies, but rather, rather kind of the buckets that we usually strategize around. What are the main things we're trying to do with our security technologies? Foundational security is, is literally the protection to verify the trustworthiness of the device. You can think of it quite literally as the root of trust. It starts with the hardware, right? It starts with security attestation and knowing with confidence that when you hit that power button, that the individual pieces are starting up in a trustworthy manner and are running what you expected them to. Workload protection is all about the protecting what the computer's actually doing, right? What are the workloads actually running on that computer? And so providing hardware-based trusted execution environments for data in flight and use and at rest by providing that hardware level of isolation. Software liability is really about providing and enabling software robustness, but at the hardware level. So most common route exploitation into systems is through software, um, but at the hardware level, we're actually hardening software by, by providing good rails and verification checkpoints to tackle entire classes of vulnerabilities, um, to squash them at the software level. And so we're bringing this security to the forefront of just everything we work on, how we do it, what we do, and we're relentless in our pursuit of driving security further. That's pretty awesome. Could you and Jerry maybe talk a little bit about how we go through and empower and enable this ecosystem you touched on? Absolutely. Sure. So I'll start out and then I'll, I'll pass it over to um, Jerry. So one of the things I wanted to touch on is, you know, everything I just talked about, like, it's great, right? Those are amazing things that we're doing for security. But the why I think is so important. How does all this manifest? How does it manifest in ways that actually impact our customers? So how does it manifest when we're partnering, really helping them integrate and actually attest to the security in their systems? Because remember, Intel is a piece of a larger system, right? Our components go into other systems. So we're not the end system, right? So how we partner and integrate is really important. And that also means we need to enable our partner and customers processes for security. So what we do for security has a trickle effect into their processes. So in this empowering piece, um, and actually I'll let Jerry talk on this one, but the last one's around information sharing. So really at the end of the day, helping others in the ecosystem understand where they stand from a risk perspective by us being incredibly committed to transparency. And I'm gonna hand this over to Jerry because this is quite literally his baby and uh, he's the best one to talk about this. Yeah, I'd say one, one example of how we, empowers through our annual product security report, security report, which provides a holistic annual view of the security advisories we released, you know, the previous year. So through our public security advisories, we disclose not only issues reported from external sources, but also those found internally by Intel. Uh, these advisories go out on the second Tuesday of each month as part of our coordinated vulnerability disclosure process. You know, this is the process we use uh, to to ensure uh, mitigations are available to customers before issues are publicly disclosed. So along with our advisories, we often publish technical papers that dive deeper, uh, you know, to help customers understand uh, these issues better and the scope of the threat that those issues may pose. That's interesting. I, I wanted to pose a question to you. I sometimes hear in security circles. Uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing if a vendor's you know, disclosing vulnerabilities from your perspective? Yeah, I, th I think concerning uh, the disclosure of vulnerabilities, there's sometimes misconceptions that mm -hmm. more disclosures mean that uh, products are less secure, but that's not always the case, right? Yeah. As we will see on the next slide, the, the bulk of our disclosures are the result of our proactive efforts uh, internally and through partnerships with the security research community uh, so that, you know, we're working to close the gaps before they can be exploited. So you really have to look behind the scenes to determine if disclosures are coming, you know, from investments into mature processes designed to help customers and end users accurately understand the risk expo exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, and as part of our Security First pledge, we are making these investments and being transparent about it, uh, what we find and uh, which is really not consistent across the industry, right? And I think our annual product security report, you know, demonstrates the results of our investments in proactive security research. So uh, as you can see on the slide, for example, 
In 2020, we published uh, security advisories addressing 231 potential vulnerabilities. And of those, 109 or 47% were discovered internally by Intel and another 105 were reported through our bug bounty program. So this means that 92% of the issues that we addressed uh, in 2020 were the result of our investments in this space. That's awesome. So, and we mentioned it, and I think it's a real demonstration of an organization's maturity uh, and capability. But could you both of you talk a little bit about you know, these investments and what are we doing? I see a lot of figures here, some pretty impressive numbers. Yeah, I think the the scale of our capabilities in the security space is really unmatched, you know, in the silicon industry and perhaps something people aren't fully aware of. For example, uh, on that last slide, you know, we showed that in 2020, 47% of the vulnerabilities we addressed came from our internal security research. Um, and where did those come from? Well, like we see here, you know, a lot of those came from the 120 hackathons or red team events that we held. Uh, another area we invest heavily in is academic research with over 40 research teams being funded. Um, <clears throat> Stephanie, can you tell us about some of these SDL numbers? Yes, as I mentioned before, we have a really uh, robust SDL process that all of our projects go through. And um, as of writing this slide, we had 7,000 active projects being tracked through the security SDL. And all of those are getting anywhere from 40 to 400 security tasks assigned to them. I think it's important to tie back a lot of the points you two made. You know, it's, you know, are you working with a vendor or supplier that discloses CVEs? I think we've definitely all agree that, you know, sharing information about vulnerabilities is critical for uh, partners and customers to be able to make decisions and help remediate risks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked a lot about Intel's SDL-like practices. And I think that's a hallmark of a very mature, capable organization if you have these you know, 40 to 400 tests, as uh, Stephanie highlighted to us. Uh, you, Jerry and I both came from the PCERT world. That's another mark of, you know, are you working with a good supplier? Do they have a dedicated product security and incident response team? And uh, it, those people will help be the broker between the security researcher or the finder mm -hmm and be able to work with them to under triage the issue and understand what's going on. And then conversely, they work internally with the engineering teams to make sure that issue is clearly understood and there are plans made to get it fixed. Now, does your supplier have a bug bounty program? I think that's a pretty important aspect of a mature, capable organization. Any thoughts either you wanna share about Intel's bug bounty program? Um, just that you can find information about our bounty program at intel.com slash security. Um, <clears throat> we run a, several different programs. You know, we're out, we're actually active in the ecosystem, you, you know, talking with other companies about how they implement bounty programs, you know, sharing best practices, things like that. So, um, yeah, anyway, intel.com slash security, you can find more information about that. That's awesome. And then you know, Stephanie touched on it about that offensive security research. You know, does your supplier red team itself? Are they looking at their uh, software, their hardware, their processes to understand where there might be gaps and where you know corrections need to be made? And is that information getting fed back through an SDL like process? And I think next you want to think about you know is the partner organization you're working with, do they openly communicate about security updates? You know, how, how are you informed that there are updates available? And this is where I think uh, Intel is really unique in the industry with our Intel platform update program, where we work with the ecosystem to make sure that uh, fixes are reported, tested, and, you know, very, con very uh, rolled out in a very managed fashion. You know, that's, uh, I think, very unique amongst the hardware industry. And then uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, longevity. Stephanie has it here on the slide. So what can you talk about, you know, a vendor's capability to have that longevity, that frame of reference? Yeah, and so I think it's it's kind of an overlooked thought oftentimes is when there is a vulnerability found in something, how far back in their products can they actually easily go to test and triage, right? Mm. Because <clears throat> these products live for a very long time out in the wild. And if you can't quickly also test and triage your older project, 
um, and your older products, um, there's unknown risk out there. And so we've got labs set up where we literally have our products going back at least 10 years at a minimum where we can quickly test and triage. This has been a really educational and uh, insightful conversation today. You know, any final thought, parting thoughts anyone wants to share? Uh, I think we've touched briefly on some of the investments that Intel's making in product security assurance, but there's much more that we weren't able to cover in this short video. Uh, I think in today's threat landscape, it's critical that companies are making these investments to help protect the entire ecosystem for both known and emerging threats. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Intel's a leader in this space. Yeah, and just I hope this was helpful for people to understand and to help them think about security is it is both what we do um, and what features we choose to work on, but it's how we do it also around our processes and our hygiene and making sure that no matter what we're working on, we're doing it well. Um, and so I hope this helped people understand sort of what Intel's approach is to this and find look at the deck for more information. We weren't able to cover the full content of it. That's great. This was uh, really educational. I think that we're going to call this a wrap on this episode of Chips and Salsa. You know, Jerry and I both really want to thank Stephanie for coming and joining us today uh, and sharing this exciting content with us. We encourage you know the viewers to review the deck, and you know, as you have any questions after you click the link below, reach out to your Intel team. And you know, for myself, my co-host Jerry, you know, thanks a lot. Enjoy your day. Thanks, everyone.